So uh, I can still remember, I know many of you started school or aware of the beginning of school either two weeks ago or last week. And I talked to a kindergartner this morning who went to kindergarten for the first time. And I can remember when my daughter, who's now in college, she went to the kindergarten for the first time. And I, I've shared here what it was like putting her on the bus for the first time, um, how scary it was at the bus stop, putting her on the bus for the first time. We had her so nearby at our, our preschool at my old church for so long, and now we were just kind of releasing her into the public school uh, system. And I, I wondered if, you know, uh, you know, her mother had always told her how wonderful she was. And I, I wondered if the other kindergartners would a agree uh, at the level that her, her mother held her in. I said good things too. And uh, so I was so nervous that um, we had an after school program at my old church, just like we do here. And so I rode the bus from our church to pick her up at the elementary school, thinking that would, maybe if she had had a hard first day at kindergarten, that would make things better. It, did, it didn't. It was uh, very traumatizing to have me on that bus. Uh, she did fine at school. Uh, but what she didn't do fine at was um, in our after school program. One day, I, th I think it was that week or maybe the week following in our after school program, she walked through the gym and she said, that one of the older kids called her a poofy polar bear head. And I mean, ah, oh, those words, poofy polar bear head. Can you imagine? Kids can be so cruel. But it was for a five-year-old, that's devastating, whatever that means. You know, it was devastating and she didn't want to go back. We made her go back because it builds resilience, but she didn't want to go back. Your self-esteem can be so fragile I guess, at that age. And, you know, there's so many outside forces that chip away at our self-esteem. And that's what we're talking about. Really, we're talking about self-worth, but self-esteem um, and where it falls in the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. As you know, if you've been with us this past month, we've been moving through John, the Gospel of John, chapter 6. And we're hearing about Jesus talking about himself as the bread of life. And what does that mean? What does it mean for Jesus to be the bread of life? And so we've been coupling that with looking at the psychologist Maslow built this years ago, this hierarchy of needs. The idea, as he looked at it, healthy individuals, the idea that first you got to feed people before you do anything else. You have to have full bellies. And then you've got to make sure they're sheltered and they feel safe and secure. And then you've got to make sure they're connected to healthy relationships. And so we've talked about how Jesus did that. Jesus, he fed people, feeding the 5,000. He didn't ask them, why didn't you bring your lunch? He just fed them. And that's what we continue to do through our mission partners like Katie Christian Ministries. You know, we, we feed people and we don't ask any questions because we recognize that need. And then we talked about how Jesus a relationship with Jesus can help us feel safe and secure in, in ways that the world does not offer because it's this lasting relationship that we have with Jesus that can shelter us from, from any storm we might face. And then, and then the relationships that we're given through Jesus and through the church. And we talked about that last week, the importance of healthy relationships. And so this week, after we've been fed and we feel safe and secure and we've been connected to healthy relationships, now we can begin to talk about self-esteem. And that's where I have trouble because self-esteem seems so connected to things that are fleeting, that are temporary. You know, for me personally, and maybe not for you, for me personally, Self-esteem is dependent in some way on whether someone has called me a poofy polar bear head or some other awful thing or said some other awful thing about my appearance or my, my, uh, the way I, 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 I go about life. Or maybe I'm measuring my self-esteem, my feeling of self-worth on how much I have achieved. And so if I win, my self-esteem is high. If I lose, my self-esteem is, is low. And so I, I've never liked how self-esteem 
feel so tied to these outside forces that are, are beyond my control and how it begins to shape these outside forces begin to shape how I see myself, my confidence level, my very identity. Today's gospel, today's gospel, um, Jesus is talking more and more about what it means to be the bread of life. And in today's gospel, he says, you know, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you will have no life in me. And the religious leaders have a question, and it's an honest question. They're asking, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? I mean, there was a lot of talk in today's gospel about eating of my flesh and drinking of my blood. You can understand how weird that must have sounded to religious leaders, maybe even to us. Uh, the, even the, the Romans, when they looked at the early church, and they heard about the practice of Holy Communion, and they heard that they were eating and drinking the body and blood of their Messiah, the Romans thought the early Christians, they accused them of being cannibals. They were, they were confused by this teaching. And Jesus, Jesus talks more and more trying to help the religious leaders understand a little bit more about, you know, how you're understanding it is not really what I'm saying, but also at the same time, it's exactly what I'm saying. I'm giving all of myself so that you may have life. I'm not holding anything back so that your identity may be shaped not by how the world views you, but by how I view you. I'm giving you my whole self, Jesus says to us, so that I can shape your life. Let my life shape your life. In today's uh, first lesson, we hear from the book of Proverbs, um, book of Proverbs, we hear that wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. So Proverbs is wisdom literature in the Bible. There's all uh, sorts of literature in the Bible, and wisdom literature is one of them. Wisdom is um, a guidance for life, but not really a guarantee, but it's a guidance. It's like you've probably heard, maybe you have, maybe you haven't, this proverb that if you train children in the right way, when they are old, they will not stray. If you train children in the right way, when they're old, they will not stray. That's what we hope for Abby, uh, our daughter. We hope we've trained her up in the right way. And so as she's in college and life beyond college, we hope that she will not stray. But we know that's not a guarantee. That's not a promise. Maybe it's a probability. But it is something in the book of Proverbs that God has given for us. And God, uh, in the book of Proverbs, uh, describes it as, as Lady Wisdom. Lady Wisdom has built this house for us. Built this house for us. We did not build it. She built it. She built this house for us, and she's prepared this banquet for us. There's so much that the world offers us to feast on, to feast on that, 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 that shapes us. But Lady Wisdom opens up her house sets this banquet table for us so we can feast on the things that will bring us life. So we can be shaped by something outside ourselves that is eternal. Jesus says in today's gospel that I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. Jesus wants to shape not just our life individually, but shape us all as a body of Christ, as a team. Uh, I, was, uh, I was on the cross country and track team in high school, sort of. Uh, my junior year at Stratford, I um, went out for the team. Uh, did I have any prior real running experience? I did not. Was I fast? I was not. Could I run a long ways? Nope. But it was a no-cut sport. 
that I heard. And so I wanted one of those letter jackets. So my junior year, I went out for cross country and I did all the workouts and the, and the coach was gracious enough to have me on the team despite my flaws. And, uh, and you know what? That junior year, we won districts. Now I had to run with my jersey inside out so I wouldn't hurt the team score, but I was there. And then when we did track, I got to run the two mile, which if you know the two mile, it's eight laps around the track, which is plenty of time to get lapped during the race, which I did. And after a number of those, my track coach pulled me aside and said, England, um, can you do this? And I said, I can do this. Great. Can you hold a clip? And I said, I'm pretty sure I can. Awesome, you can be our new manager. And I lettered in management. I'll have you know at Stratford High School. I was on that team, that coach, despite my many flaws, and they were many when it came to cross country and track, invited me on that team and made sure I was a part of it in some way. You see, that's what Jesus is doing for us as the body of Christ. Jesus wants to shape our life individually, and Jesus wants to shape us as a church. For that's what we are. We are the body of Christ. Pastor Ari and I have, have gone back to what one of the uh, psychologists in our congregation said about Maslow's hierarchy and the bread of life uh, in John chapter 6. And when I asked her her in the email about self-esteem, she said that self-esteem is about who I see myself as an individual, how I'm unique and special with my community, but it's also made her think about how each of us being a part of one body, which we are, And we have these individual and unique functions and talents and gifts that we can use in this body. Jesus doesn't want us to be shaped by outside worldly forces that don't have our best intentions at heart. Jesus wants to shape us, shape our lives individually because Though we may have problem with our own self-esteem and our own worth, and we may measure it against our own successes and losses and measure it against how the world, we perceive the world to see us, Jesus looks at us and names us as ones of unconditional, unending worth and value in his eyes. And Jesus wants that view of us to shape us. And Jesus wants us to recognize that Jesus calls us through our flaws to be a part of this body of Christ, to use our unique gifts. And so that's why I'm glad we have a ministry fair today. I encourage you following the service to take one lap, see if there's something that God might be calling you to. In our uh, prayers during communion, You may not have heard it, but I hear it every time I pray it. And I think it's our calling for all of us today as we receive the living bread from heaven. May we be, as we pray at communion, may we be what we receive here. Your body for the life of the world. Amen.